So in this last part of the module on consciousness, we're going to talk about altered states of consciousness by looking at hypnosis and psychoactive drugs that alter consciousness and looking at how they work. So hypnosis is a procedure that produces relaxation and narrowed attention. It essentially shuts off what you might think of as your conscious brain and really gives most of the control to your unconscious brain, which is then subject to subliminal perception. Now, not everyone is, resist not everyone is susceptible to hypnosis. About 10 to 20 percent of the population are resistant. They usually do not believe in it. They don't believe it does anything to them. And in fact, they tend to be resistant to the effects of hypnosis, both recreationally. So if they go to a magic show and, or a hypnotist and they try to hypnotize them for fun, um, they tend to not have any effect. Another 10 to 15 percent of people seem to be susceptible to it. Um, sometimes when I've done hypnosis demonstrations in class, I've had students actually have to get up and leave in class because they're so susceptible. Again, I don't have any professional training as a hypnotist, but some people are very, very susceptible to the relaxing tones, the flashing lights, or a medallion that you flash in front of them. And there are some pretty standard procedures you do to change your voice and your intonation, as you may notice how I've changed mine. Now, hypnosis can do certain things in clinical settings. It cannot cure your addiction to cigarettes or alcohol. Um, it is not going to allow you to recover false memories or um, uh, um, hidden memories. In fact, actually, what we do know, though, the most effective thing for hypnosis is that it is able to produce some degree of anesthesia, so it reduces your perception of pain. So for people in, with chronic back pain or other kinds of chronic pain position, uh, conditions, it can be very effective. Also, it allows some sensory distortions, so I can, uh, somebody who's hypnotized can be made to hear certain things. Um, that other people don't hear. Um, again, they're not extreme. Uh, lastly, you can trigger disinhibition. So in cases where um, if someone I know gets hypnotized by a hypnotist and the hypnotist uh, convinces them to cluck like a chicken, um, they may do it because they're disinhibited, right? They'll do things that they normally wouldn't do. Um, lastly, it produces some amnesia. So you can, to a certain degree, now you won't allow people to completely forget things, but you can reduce some of their memories, so they're less likely to be able to remember things, okay? We know how this works, actually. So this is a PET scan. A PET scan is a, a brain scan that measures activity in certain parts of the brain. You can see where the red dot is. These areas are part of the cingulate gyrus. The cingulate gyrus controls some ethical and moral decision-making. It controls some emotional experiences, and in fact, this cingulate gyrus seems to be highly active during hypnosis. So this may be part of your brain that's responsible for that um, subliminal perception and that disinhibition in this area. And you can see these are brain scans from the top of the head looking down in different slices here. So this is towards the very top. This is going down towards the center all right, and deeper. This is on the side. And these two, you can see here's an eyeball, eyeballs right here. So this is from the front. Now, there are two theories about what hypnosis does. One is that people are just going along with it. The other is that it's truly producing disassociation, that it is separating out those two streams of consciousness that we talked about earlier. Um, what we believe is happening, what most evidence says, is that people are really not role-playing. They truly are not able to remember some of the things that happened to them, even when we test them repeatedly. Um, and that really what's happening is that your conscious brain that's controlled by your prefrontal cortex seems to be shutting down, which allows your cingulate gyrus potentially, right, the area we just talked about, to take over, which maybe is responsible for this disinhibition, the anesthesia, and some of the other effects. Um, we do know that things like highway hypnosis, certain kinds of drugs also work like meditation, so they can reduce pain. They allow people to detach from themselves so they don't feel like things are happening to them. You may have heard when some people are undergoing traumatic experiences, they describe this sort of out-of-body, detached-from-themselves experience. Um, that may be something like this, where they're essentially separating out their conscious experience from the trauma that they're currently experiencing. We also know that, right, as we talk about with cases of hypnosis, people are really less concerned about being judged socially, so they're able to do things in crowded rooms with other people watching, even strangers, that normally they probably wouldn't do. Now, 
while you're sitting here listening to me, I want you to look at all of these. Hopefully you know what all these drugs are. I'm sure you know marijuana and methamphetamine. Morphine is a drug that's used for pain control in hospitals, and sometimes it's abused like opiates, and it's in the same family as opiate drugs like Oxycontin and Vicodin. Alcohol, tobacco, general antidepressants, and lastly, ecstasy, either MDMA, Molly, uh, anything like it. So I want you, in your head, to think about, and I want you to commit, how dangerous are these? Zero meaning no danger at all. One, minimal danger, mild danger. Um, three would be moderate danger, right? Two or three. Um, four, highly moderate or high, high to moderate to high danger. Um, and then five, severe danger. How, how bad are these? Now, the other thing is, how do you know? So how do you know how bad these are? Is it from experience with friends or family members or maybe even yourself? Is it from what you've seen on TV? A lot of the ways we think about drugs are highly dependent on our subjective view, what our parents have told us, what we've seen happen, the commercials and the other kinds of anti-drug campaigns that we've heard about. Now, we're not just going to talk about drugs that alter consciousness. Let's talk about the harm that comes from drugs, and we'll come back and talk about the ones that alter consciousness. So, they're generally the old way we classified drugs was based off of the three categories. There are stimulants, which tend to stimulate the nervous system. Those are things like methamphetamine, cocaine, other kinds of Adderall, um, Ritalin. Those are all are in the same family. Um, a little bit different, but also we generally classified as stimulant is caffeine. Um, caffeine works very differently in the brain than methamphetamine and some of those other drugs. Then there are depressants, which tend to slow down the nervous system. The classic two groups of depressants are alcohol, and sleep aids like uh, benzodiazepines, those are things like Valium, what we sometimes call tranquilizers you might take for anxiety. Then there's opiate drugs. So opiate drugs are things like Vicodin, Oxycontin, Fentanyl. All of those are also depressants. They slow down the nervous system, but actually, they actually tend to depress breathing. They stop you from breathing. So in fact, opiate drugs, and of course, there is a huge um, crisis of opiate addiction around the United States of not just medical um, uh, opiates, but also of heroin and other kinds of heroin-like drugs. Um, that is the most common reason people die. The, the most, the number one drug that people will die from and go to the ER is going to be um, uh, opiates like Oxycontin, fentanyl, things like that. Um, stimulant drugs, you, you're not as likely to die. It is possible. Um, depressants actually tend to be the ones where you're most likely to die while you're on the drug itself. Um, even alcohol, there's a high rate of heart attacks amongst our alcoholics. Stimulants, on the other hand, like cocaine, methamphetamine, amphetamines, Adderall, Ritalin, yeah, it is possible to have a heart attack, but what you tend to see, actually, the worst effect that people tend to get, besides the sort of the cravings, the addiction to it, they can't stop doing it, um, is the depression that comes afterwards. So there is some increased risk of suicide. Um, they may get symptoms of what looks like clinical depression. Uh, then there's this catch-all category of what we call hallucinogens, and this, this is such a diverse group. And they, they all work so differently, right? So there are the classic hallucinogens like peyote, magic mushrooms, uh, LSD. Those all work to alter what you perceive and also your emotions, right? If you know someone that's used magic mushrooms or LSD, they may be very giggly and very happy. Um, it tends to be sort of an elation kind of experience. But you also have the classic visual hallucinations, depending on how much you've taken of those. Then you get another set of hallucinogenic drugs. Um, so those are the ones that are dissociatives. So they cause you to have these out-of-body experiences. So they tend to give you the sense of you are floating above your body, you're detached from your body, kind of like the, what we were just talking about with hypnosis. Those tend to be drugs like salvia, salvia divinorum, um, which you can smoke. It's illegal in California, but it's not very commonly used. Um, marijuana in high doses triggers that. Ketamine, which is a club drug and also an anesthetic, and then special, um, or not special K, uh, PCP, sorry. Um, so PCP also. Uh, and in fact, ketamine is a derivative of PCP, so they are in the same family. Um, then, so you've got those two different kinds, right? You've got the visual hallucinogenic drugs like magic mushrooms and LSD, and then you've got PCP, ketamine, those kinds of drugs that give you the out-of-body experiences. 
Then you get these what are called empathogenic drugs. Empathogenic drugs are ones that make you feel certain emotions very intensely. So the classic example of that is ecstasy or um, MDMA or Molly, um, which triggers this elated, like warm, comfortable, you want to touch people, you want to be close to them. And there are similar drugs like MDA and a few others that trigger that same kind of effect. Okay. Again, this categorization is not actually the best because it really doesn't describe for you how each of these drugs works. What's better is to actually sort of look at how these drugs work on the particular neurotransmitters in the brain. Because essentially, um, methamphetamine and cocaine work very similar on the brain, and they work differently than caffeine. So even though those are both stimulants, they actually are different drugs. Another example, alcohol and sedatives like Valium or Xanax. Alcohol and sedatives work the same. They increase a chemical in the brain called GABA, which is kind of like a break. So it shuts down your brain. It reduces anxiety. Um, it reduces impulse control. Um, it makes you sleepy in high doses, right? So at low doses, both alcohol and sedatives reduce anxiety and uh, reduce impulse control. And then at high doses, they both make you sleepy. And they work on the same mechanism. Then there's cocaine and amphetamines, which work by increasing a chemical called dopamine in the brain, which is very different than how caffeine works. So by looking at those drugs, we can start to understand what's happening to them. But why people use these psychoactive drugs is not so simple as to say, well, some drugs are bad and some drugs are fine, right? These same drugs that sometimes are used for medicinal purposes are also can become recreationally used. As you know, if you have any friends who use Adderall or Ritalin without a prescription because maybe you're selling yours to them. So Adderall is a type of amphetamine. It's an amphetamine salt like Ritalin. Um, it's actually not much different from methamphetamine. They work the exact same way in the brain. The only two differences is that Adderall you take in pill form and you swallow, whereas methamphetamine you might smoke or inject, um, and the dose that you're taking at a single time. Every single drug that you're going to use is going to have some side effect, right? If you're going to take Adderall, there's going to be some side effect that you're going to get, and it's not just going to go to your brain. It's going to have some side effect on your body too. Now, in low doses, those side effects are not very severe, right? Which is why um, physicians tend to regulate your dosage of certain drugs. Um, but some of the drugs that we traditionally have seen as being bad, like LSD or ketamine, actually have medicinal uses. So we're starting to investigate the use of LSD and ketamine for treating things like depression and anxiety. So we really do have a, 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 a drugs are much more complicated than the simple some are bad and some are good. And, and they really can, in some cases, the ones that we traditionally think of as being negative can actually be very, very beneficial. But many drugs, especially stimulant drugs, so Adderall, amphetamines, Ritalin, um, methamphetamine, cocaine, all have withdrawal symptoms. So when you don't have that drug in your system anymore, right, whereas Adderall made you energetic and excited and happy to see people, um, your withdrawal symptoms are going to be the opposite, right? So you may notice that after you've been on Adderall for a while, you tend to get what we call social zombieism. Low energy, you don't want to go out, you're not interested in meeting up with friends, you want to sit at home and play video games all day. That is an effect of being essentially in withdrawal where your body isn't responding to the normal dopamine that you're producing every day. But every drug, whether it's opiate drugs, alcohol, right? There's a high rate of alcoholics who have heart attacks after they've stopped binging. So they try to sober up and they have a high rate of, of um, heart attacks uh, the day after they've stopped. So there are every drug potentially has withdrawal symptoms. So be careful about stopping any drug cold turkey. And in fact, right, when we think about how addiction works, it's the result of many things. It's the result of both the cravings of the drug itself, but it's also social factors. How acceptable is it? Um, do you tend to use it? So are you drinking alcohol to reduce anxiety? Well, then if you're going to use, because your alcohol only lasts an hour, so you're going to keep drinking more and more, right, to try to reduce your anxiety. And in fact, about 50% of all people that suffer from drug addiction or drug abuse um, have a correlated um, psychological disorder like anxiety or depression. Now, by understanding drugs and how they work, though, it has allowed us to understand these different levels of consciousness. Remember, we were talking about how ketamine can be used to explore how people disassociate from experiences. So drugs can actually be very, very useful in helping us to understand how the brain works.